Hello in full person, this is Anton, and today we're going to discuss some of the recent updates from our neighbor Mars. In this case, focusing on various observations, various exciting images, and also, once again, a few discoveries that kind of surprised everyone. But as in previous videos, let's I guess start with a few images. Some of the exciting images of Mars like we've never seen it before. And specifically observations from the Mars Odyssey that was actually able to show us Mars from a slightly different perspective. Although it was really the perspective of the Olympus Mons, the largest volcano on Mars and the largest volcano in the solar system, that I guess made it kind of exciting. But in this case, while the Odyssey was taking these images, it was also able to see three different types of clouds on Mars in quite a lot of detail. And that's because Mars, unlike Earth, does actually have three separate types of clouds. It essentially has CO2 clouds, water clouds, and of course, dust clouds, with all three visible in different types of light. But during its exploration of the surface of various mountains and various volcanoes, something else super exciting was discovered on the famous volcanoes on Mars. With all of this reported in the study you can find in the description. And so here, by focusing on the Olympus Mons and actually a few other famous structures, to everyone's surprise, researchers discovered unusual formation of water frost on top of many different structures on Mars. And these frost formations were really not expected because mountains here, first of all, are actually really close to the equator, and second of all, in many cases, this was at relatively high altitudes where there's just not enough pressure and the thin atmosphere of Mars is technically inefficient at cooling the surface enough for all of this frost to form. Yet nevertheless, several locations around Olympus Mons, the largest volcano, and a few other volcanoes basically contained presence of this unusual frost that was very likely water-based in nature and potentially represented approximately 150,000 tons of water basically being deposited as tiny ice particles. With all of this also happening pretty much every day, suggesting that this is an active cycle. But unlike frost on planet Earth, here it's believed to be extremely thin. Possibly only one one hundredth of a millimeter, or basically the thickness of human hair. And that's because obviously the Martian atmosphere is really thin and overall does not actually contain that much water. Nevertheless, by tracking this, it can possibly help us understand where we can actually find water on Mars and how it seems to relocate from one place to another. And so this was actually a pretty exciting discovery. But then there was another important discovery about the biggest water deposits on Mars along the Martian poles, or basically the deposits in the polar ice on Mars. And previously, it was sort of assumed that, just like on Earth, this was probably a somewhat mobile and somewhat dynamic environment, where ice was probably moving, recycling, evaporating and reappearing, and most importantly, flowing in some kind of a direction, just like ice does on Earth. But even though polar ice should flow, it was never clear how fast. And specifically, to date, nobody has ever observed any flow present in any of the polar ice. And so here the assumption was that maybe this ice flow is just super slow. But the question was, how slow? And there were essentially four potential conclusions. Maybe it was moving slow because it was too cold. Maybe it was moving slow because there were too many impurities. Or maybe this was a homogeneous mixture that was basically slowing down the material. Lastly, the fourth explanation suggested that maybe the size was layered in such a way that it basically created a kind of a lattice that basically stopped the ice from flowing completely. And turns out that maybe this is the explanation after all. A lot of recent observations discovered that the ice here doesn't seem to move at all. And this unusual layered lattice-like structure potentially explains why. Which in essence means that, unlike on planet Earth, this ice seems to be structured just a little bit differently. But, unlike Earth, this is not the only thing that's different on Mars. As a matter of fact, one of the recent discoveries, especially from the Perseverance rover that's able to listen to Mars, scientists have now discovered that even sound seems to act differently. And specifically, by measuring the speed of sound on Mars in different frequencies, researchers actually discovered something nobody expected once again. When it comes to the sound on Mars, it seems to vary quite a lot depending on the place, the season, the temperature, and possibly a lot of other properties. For example, sounds of approximately 240 Hz seem to travel 10 meters per second slower than most of the high-pitched sounds that travel much faster. 
And so as a result, any kind of an oral communication on Mars would sound super weird, with different frequencies arriving at different times. And the reason for this is because Martian atmosphere, unlike Earth, is basically CO2. And the way carbon dioxide absorbs acoustic energy makes it transfer sounds differently depending on the frequency, with the speed of sound being particularly affected by the atmospheric temperature. And more importantly, the overall pressure, and specifically the levels of CO2, seem to affect the speed the most. And so when the temperatures during the day change by about 50 degrees Celsius, 90 degrees Fahrenheit, this can actually shift the speed of sound by up to 30 meters per second, with this effect being even more pronounced in a lot of polar regions on Mars. And so in essence, this basically means that the sound on Mars travels very, very differently from what we're used to right here on planet Earth. But surprisingly, it's not affected by things like dust or even dust storms. It really seems to be only affected by carbon dioxide levels and temperature, which will make any acoustic communication on Mars very different and very peculiar, while also potentially one day affecting things like, for example, helicopters flying on Mars. Because in this case, acoustics do come into play. So yeah, definitely a somewhat unexpected discovery. But here's actually another picture, just for funsies. The picture of famous spiders on Mars. Unusual features that seem to usually appear around the South Pole, mostly during springtime, and seem to be formed as a result of carbon dioxide sublimating from within Mars. But the reason they actually form the way they form is basically because sublimation is not uniform and results in these unequal patches where all of the CO2 ice underneath sublimates at different speeds. And it essentially ends up deforming the ground underneath, forming these unusual Martian bubbles. This is actually a seasonal event and happens on Mars pretty much every two years. But since we're talking about surface of Mars, there's actually something else Martian scientists are super curious about, especially when it comes to Martian colonization. And here we're talking about some kind of a location, such as some kind of a subterranean lava tube, that could one day serve as a location for a possible manned mission. Because by actually trying to build a base inside one of these tubes, we might be able to protect future astronauts from things like asteroids, cosmic radiation, and a lot of other dangerous elements on the surface of Mars. And quite a few of these unusual holes have been discovered on Mars, but because of their structure, it's basically impossible to see what's inside. As a matter of fact, it's even impossible to identify exactly what we're looking at and how these were formed. For example, these could be volcanic in nature, or they could be collapsed skylights, or something entirely different, unique to Mars. But right now, based on the recent study, researchers don't actually think this could be good for us after all. As a matter of fact, they don't think these form lava tube-like formations where astronauts could survive. Instead, they believe these are somewhat similar to what we find on Hawaii. And these are basically pit craters, usually up to 180 meters deep and up to one kilometer wide. And these don't connect to lone caves or lava tubes and are basically a result of a collapse much deeper underground. And so in essence, these basically could be just individual holes that will be kind of difficult to get into and get out of, and would not have lava tubes inside where we can possibly create a colony. And the scientists behind this recent study even present a really solid reason for why they don't think Mars should even have lava tubes and why we'll never be able to find them, unlike on, for example, the Moon. Now, today we know that the Moon actually has quite a few of these, and a lot of these have been proposed as a potential shelter or a possible location for a colony, especially because many of these would actually have stable temperatures and protect astronauts from anything outside. But it seems to be a slightly different story on Mars, and these structures just seem to be kind of different. And they also seem to be giant. Because Martian gravity is much lower, Mars tends to form structures that are also much, much bigger which is one of the reasons why it also has the largest volcano in the solar system. Either way though, at least for now, these holes on Mars are going to remain a mystery. Okay, here's another cool picture from Mars. And here you're looking at sand dunes in Martian springtime. And this is once again when carbon dioxide starts to sublimate, forming these unusual patterns of dark spots, similar to those spiders I showed you previously. And so because of the sublimation of CO2, Martian surface tends to form a lot of these extremely unique features that we don't actually see anywhere else in the solar system. Definitely very interesting, very bizarre, but also very beautiful. Okay, one more discovery. Once again, in regards to colonization of Mars, 
and the potential dangers. And this one comes from the now defunct InSight mission that over several years was able to measure a lot of seismic activity on Mars, mostly as a result of Mars quakes, but also various impacts. And it was actually able to detect approximately 1300 seismic events, allowing the scientists in the recent study to estimate the overall impact frequency, which they also combined with the simulation of various asteroids around Mars, focusing on the evolution of asteroid orbits over a period of 100 million years. And while essentially one of the main discoveries was that Mars, I guess as expected, seems to have approximately 2.5 times more collisions, and especially dangerous collisions, compared to planet Earth. And apart from that, based on these seismic detections, up to 360 collisions have been detected and confirmed with meteorites the size of a typical basketball. In this case, forming craters up to 8 meters in size and actually happening pretty much daily. Or basically, every single day on Mars, somewhere on the surface, we expect a meteorite to collide with the surface, forming a crater up to 8 meters or 26 feet in size with a much larger crater, approximately 30 meters or 100 feet, very likely happening monthly. And these would be relatively large explosions. In this case, the blast zone for the smaller crater is up to about 1 kilometer in size, whereas for the larger crater, it could be up to 3 kilometers. And so that means that if you have a base somewhere within this region, it could technically be affected by sound debris. Which of course means that building a colony on the surface would possibly be not very safe. And so yeah, trying to find some kind of a lava tube or some other location where we can actually shelter astronauts would most likely be the only way to have a permanent colony. And last but not least, we also had a few studies focusing on potential signs of life or I guess potential signs of organic chemistry that generally seems to produce lifelike signs. And here we had three separate studies. One of them focused on what's known as perchlorate salts, a type of a salt that we know exists on Mars in large quantities and in this particular case, there was actually a bit of a mystery of what actually forms methane inside of these various compounds containing perchlorate, because generally methane, at least on Earth, is associated with life. And here, by studying this in more detail, scientists once again confirm that methane seems to appear at night, disappears during the day, and also fluctuates seasonally, sometimes jumping in concentration by 40 times. And so because of the combination of perchlorates, methane, and some organic compounds discovered on Mars, quite a few scientists assumed that maybe this was actually signs of life. But here, in a recent study, a scientific team was able to show that perchlorate actually acts as a kind of a sealant, preventing methane from escaping from within soil and also encouraging its production through chemical means. And so in some sense, you don't actually have to have life to explain these observations. Another discovery focused on the organic compounds we seem to be finding everywhere. And normally, organics are also associated with life, but they can also be produced naturally through chemical means. And here another team discovered a really brilliant way how all of this could happen with actual physical proof. And specifically, they discovered that photolysis, or basically chemical reactions where molecules are changed by sunlight, seem to play a huge role in Martian atmosphere. They basically break apart carbon dioxide, turning it into carbon monoxide, which then results in the production of additional carbon molecules. But carbon dioxide comes in two isotopes, carbon-12 and carbon-13. And based on studies from planet Earth, we know that carbon-12 tends to actually break apart much easier, which usually leaves carbon-13 as a kind of a leftover, leaving a noticeable excess that's actually been now measured in the Martian atmosphere. And so because Martian atmosphere seems to be actually enriched in carbon-13 compared to carbon-12, this presents us with a very strong evidence that a lot of carbon materials on the surface of Mars, discovered by Curiosity and Perseverance, might actually be entirely natural, produced by photolysis over billions of years, and are not the result of some kind of ancient life. And so here the study basically shows that you don't actually have to have life to explain a lot of these observations. But there's still some hope. And that hope comes from an element that we usually don't discuss, manganese. It turns out that manganese oxide is almost impossible to form unless there is some kind of life around or unless the environment is extremely enriched in oxygen. And while, as it happens, manganese oxide has been discovered on Mars in various locations. 
And so because of the discovery of these manganese-rich sandstones, the scientists now believe back in the days Mars either had habitable conditions with a lot of oxygen, oxygen that could have been produced by photosynthetic life, or this manganese oxide was produced by microbial chemical reactions resulting in manganese oxidation. And so surprisingly, manganese oxide right now presents us with the biggest proof that back in the days Mars was either habitable or filled with life or possibly even both. But whether this life still exists is of course a question we're not going to be able to answer unless we visit Mars. But when it comes to visiting Mars, there's actually at least one exciting mission that's now been proposed instead of a helicopter. You can find a study in the description below, but here, maybe instead of some kind of a helicopter, we can actually use what the researchers refer to as Mars bees. Basically, robotic bees inspired by work from University of Tokyo that would resemble tiny drones with flexible wing flaps, much, much lighter than a helicopter, and basically arriving in large numbers. Mostly because they're so light, you can actually put a lot of them on the craft, and so even if one of them fails, we would still have quite a lot to explore the surface. And the thing is, based on the work from University of Tokyo, we know this concept works, but we just don't actually know if it's going to work in the thin Martian atmosphere. As a matter of fact, right now, one of the biggest hurdles is battery. The battery here might be a little bit too heavy for Mars, and so at the moment this is a cool proposition, but it's maybe not viable just yet. With the other big challenge being the lack of things like GPS to keep track of all of these bees flying around. Or basically keeping track of all of them autonomously would be somewhat challenging. Nevertheless, after the Martian helicopter, there are definitely some really cool propositions, and so I'm sure the next mission to Mars is going to be super exciting. But other than that, that's pretty much all I wanted to mention. I'm sure there will be more discoveries in the next few months, and I'm sure there will be more announcements and more beautiful pictures. But if you want to learn more, check out some of the previous videos about Mars in the description, because they basically explore some other ideas from the last few months. And so until future discoveries or more announcements, thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining a channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Hey, this one has a helicopter on it. Anyway, stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.